Hello everyone and welcome to a week of Linux news for the 17th of December 2016. I hope you've been enjoying the Desktop December series so far, where I'm looking at most of the desktops we have available in Linux. I have nearly finished filming the series and I have to say I'm amazed at some of the choices we have. I still can't believe the old 90s common desktop environment, CDE, is still usable nowadays. Not that I'd go and use it though, but uh, hey. The desktop I'm awarding best Linux desktop to is one of those I've already released. And no, it's not KDE, since I haven't recorded that video yet. Anyway, on with the news. We have two vulnerabilities highlighted in Linux this week, although the news sites, as always, have attempted to blow it out of proportion. This time it goes along the lines of a researcher discovered a vulnerability, highlighted said vulnerability to the program maintainers, waited for maintainers to release the fix, and then publicised the vulnerability. So, Everything was dealt with in a precise, professional manner, and no one is at risk, as long as you apply the system updates. Compare this to, say, Flash Player, where we would be hearing stories every other day about how Adobe are having to rush through another patch because someone is actively exploiting it on the internet. Same old news every other day is boring, whereas a Linux vulnerability is not so common, and therefore worth publicising. The first story is with crash notification program Apport in Ubuntu. The Apport software reads and writes crash reports in its custom crash format. There are many potential fields which can be used to store information about the crash and about the current system state. The minimal file created at crash time just contains the essential entries such as the problem type, executable path and core dump. When opened, the Apport GTK collects some basic information to display a helpful interface to the user. Package information is retrieved from the executable path and is used to provide a friendly application name and icon in the prompt. Apport can submit crash reports to different Ubuntu launchpad repositories depending on which software crashed. Package specific hook scripts can customize the contents and destination of the crash report. Problematically, there is also code which loads in the crash DB configuration directly from the crash db field, and not a local file. The code first checks if the crash db field starts with a brace, indicating the start of a Python directory. If found, the apport will call the Python's built-in eval, and executes the data passed as a Python expression, which leads to a straightforward, reliable Python code execution. This feature was introduced in August 2012 in Ubuntu 12.10, to further compound the issue, there is also another vulnerability where path traversal is allowed, and this feature was introduced in January 2007 with Ubuntu 7.04. And if that's not enough, all crash files are considered to be owned by a UID below 500. This is in the realms of privileged users, with a UID of 0 being root. The vulnerabilities combined mean that it is possible to execute an additional script from anywhere within the system with elevated privileges upon an application crash. The researcher admitted to being offered US dollars for the work on the Apport Zero Day vulnerability, but instead worked with the maintainers and the Ubuntu security team to ensure the issue was fixed. Now it would be nice if he and other researchers were offered a bug bounty to ensure that these Linux vulnerabilities don't fall into the wrong hands. The second vulnerability story is with the game music emulation engine LibGME, which is used for playing music from Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive ROMs, as well as a few other early games consoles, and it is included as part of GStreamer. They may be sat there thinking, I'm not a gamer, how could this possibly affect me? Well, LibGME gets installed with GStreamer, and GStreamer is included pre-installed under most desktop Linux distributions. In fact, I checked on my KDE system and sure enough, libgme is installed. Attempting to remove libgme results in the entire KDE desktop and associated Qt applications being removed. The exploit works by causing a heap overflow in libgme, allowing execution to break out of the memory confines and in this instance, shown in the demo, it opens up calculator. Now, of course, Calculator is nice and innocent, but that could easily be something more lethal, like oh, sudo rm-rf asterisk. Oh, there goes your entire hard drive. The malicious.spc sound file has been renamed to .flag, 
in order to look more meaningful and unsuspecting to the user. Upon opening the .flac file, GStreamer recognizes it that it is a .spc file and loads up libgme. Now it's not a browser issue as such, the exploit is taking advantage of the browser passing execution off to GStreamer. Now server-based Linux installs are unlikely to be affected, as GStreamer is not likely to be pre-installed. The issue has been patched now, so it is advisable to apply your system updates. Ubuntu is doing away with a swap partition in version 17.04, Zesty Zappos. This is a great idea because the lower price of memory has led to an increase in RAM sizes in computers. Even mobile phones, it's common to see more than 2 gig of RAM. Coupled with the decrease in price of solid state disks and their increase in usage, we are seeing more and more homes and servers utilizing a disk which doesn't tolerate being written to as many times compared to an old spinning Rust drive. The overall situation presented here makes the swap partition more redundant and even a liability. The Ubuntu have chosen to do away with the dedicated swap partition and instead are utilizing a swap file when needed. Now by default, the swap file will be no more than 5% of free disk space or two gigabytes, whichever is lower. LibreOffice is getting a new interface, very similar to Microsoft Office Ribbon Bar. At the moment, the new interface is an option in version 5.3. To enable the new toolbar, go to Tools, Options, LibreOffice General, Advanced, Experimental Features. And once you do that, you have to restart LibreOffice. The next step is under View, Toolbar Layout, and then simply toggle between Default, Singles, Toolbar, Sidebar, or Notebook Bar to see the new option in action. Personally, I have to say, if they implement this as a forced feature, I will move to an alternative Office application. I have my eye on the KDE Caligra Office. Kubuntu and Linux Mint are about to implement Plasma 5.8.4 into the Backports repository. So if you're using a long-term support release of Ubuntu 16.04 or the latest interim release of Ubuntu 16.10, you can upgrade to the long-term support version of the KDE Plasma 5.8 desktop. Now Plasma 5.8 is an improvement over the old KDE 5.5.5 desktop included in Kubuntu 16.04, and a huge improvement over the Plasma 5.6 desktop included in Linux Mint. The stability has been massively improved. For example, if you get a crash in KWIN, the desktop flickers once, then completely redraws, and you can carry on working. Crashes in the earlier release of Plasma 5 desktop were more drastic and apparent, and would sometimes involve having to log out and log back in. There's been an update of the KDE applications, and it also includes a new sound editor named K-Wave. I need to take a look through these and perhaps I'll do some reviews about KDE applications that I found useful in the new year. It looks like K-Wave will be an alternative to Audacity. I'm not sure it has all the same features of Audacity, but hey, I might give it a go. The world as your wallpaper. Marble now includes both wallpaper and a widget for Plasma that show the time on top of a satellite view of Earth with real-time day-night display. Emoticons galore. Oh, great, yeah. KCAR Select has gained the ability to show Unicode emoticons. Math is better with Julia. Cantor has a new backend for Julia, giving its users the ability to use the latest progress in scientific computing. And advanced archiving. Arc has several new features. File and folders can now be renamed, copied, or moved within the same archive. And it is now possible to select compression and encryption algorithms when creating archives. So that was a look at Week of Linux News. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all later.